questions. Our first question comes from Trinidad and Tobago. In Revelation 20, Satan gets thrown into the bottomless pit with chains tied to his hands. What do the chains and the bottomless pit represent? Well, we'll actually talk a little bit about the bottomless pit in our presentation tonight. The chains are not talking about physical chains. You can read in the book of uh, Jude, I think it's verse 6, where it says Satan and his angels are bound in chains of darkness. And uh, Satan is held by chains of circumstances. He is bound here in this world. They know their time is short. And so uh, we'll talk a little more about that in our presentation today. All right. Is it ever okay to lie? For instance, lying to save someone's life or to spare someone heartache? Well, first, when it comes to the Ten Commandments, let's, let's ask that question and just switch commandments. Is it ever okay to commit a little adultery? No. <laughs> Is it ever okay to murder a little bit? <laughs> How about a little idolatry? Uh, God wants us to be consistent. Now, I realize there's a lot of folks, you know, someone say, how are you feeling? You say, fine. You may not really be fine. And, and someone might say, well, how do I look? You look great. <laughs> From the side. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I think we're, you know, you, you don't ever want to discourage a person. But you, you want to be honest. Um, I can think of a lot of times where people were smuggling Bibles into countries like Russia. And the guards would ask them, do you have any Bibles? And they'd think. How can you be bringing a Bible into the country and lie? And they'd say, Lord, this is your work. You're going to have to protect me. And they'd say, yeah, we've got a whole truckload of them. And they actually did. And the guards thought they were kidding. They said, well, come on through. <laughs> and so there's many times when God has blessed people when they took a stand and said, we're going to be honest. Christians should be honest. Would Jesus ever lie a little? No. no. I guess there's the story of Rahab. Well, there's a lot of stories. David lied, Rahab lied, uh, Joshua used deception in battle. And so the examples of some of the great people in the Bible that, of course, Rahab's a harlot too. She had other issues, right? But the, the idea in the Bible of people sometimes using deception doesn't mean God endorsed deception. It's just being, the Bible's an honest record. It says what they did. Yeah. It doesn't mean God endorsed Rahab doing that. Okay. This next question comes from Jamaica. Please explain John 20:23, 20, where Jesus gave his disciples power to forgive sins. Does this text say that God gave the priest the same power as the disciples? Uh, no, people cannot forgive sin. But you can understand when they read this verse that sometimes folks might be confused. John 20:23, 20, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Virtually every commentary will tell you there, Christ is speaking in broad terms to the apostles. The forgiveness or the condemnation is uh, through the vehicle of sharing the gospel. So in Christ giving all believers the opportunity to share their faith, people find forgiveness. Through rejecting that message, they are condemned. And so, you know, who would trust the creature to decide who is saved re related to the Creator. And do you see anybody out there that you think you trust to decide whether or not you should be forgiven? Mm -hmm. This is the, that's a prerogative of God. God and only the Bible says can forgive sin. Now that's often been pointed to by some churches saying the priests decide who is forgiven. Why would you want a human arbitrarily saying, hmm, I think I'll forgive you, but not you? Mm -hmm. I mean, would you want your eternity in the hands of someone whimsical and fickle like that? No, he's talking about in sharing the gospel. And he's also talking about church authority there. In earlier passages, Jesus said someone might need to be put out of the church. I'm giving you that authority. But not whether or not they're forgiven by God. I'm 10 years old and wonder why some people are born with disabilities. If a baby is born with no sin, then why would they be born with an afflicting condition? It's a good question. Uh, my brother was born with cystic fibrosis. And uh, we, matter of fact, lived in Florida for many years. He finally moved from New York City to Florida because of his lungs and the problems. And, and uh, I used to ask that question. I was, my brother would ask that question too. He said, Doug, God is not fair if there is a God. Because he said, I'm so smart, but I'm sick. And you're so healthy, but you're stupid. <laughs> and he said, it's just not fair. He used to say that. Because I was a black sheep, I got into lots of trouble. My brother was very smart. Um, 
But, you know, the, the consequences of sin, God does not always reverse. You and I and people make decisions that hurt others, and the Lord allows us to experience decisions that ever others have made. God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing that any should suffer. Um, you read the story of Job? Mm -hmm. A perfect and an upright man. And look at that, all the devil heaped upon him. The reason the innocent suffer is because of evil and the devil and sin. It's a disease. It breaks God's heart. Jesus went around healing people because he wanted to relieve suffering. The disciples asked that question once. They said, Lord, here's this man born blind from birth. What did he ever do wrong that he was born blind? John chapter 9. And Jesus said he didn't do anything wrong, but that the glory of God might be seen in him. So some of these are difficult questions. When we get to heaven, you can know we can trust God. God is good. Yes. And, and uh, given the opportunity, we learn a lot about love through mm -hmm. people that struggle with disabilities. This question comes from Germany. Is heaven referred as the only, as only the city of New Jerusalem? No, uh, New Jerusalem is like the capital, and God has prepared mansions for us there. But you read in Malachi chapter 4, it says, They shall go forth, going forth from the New Jerusalem, and they'll build houses and inhabit them, they'll plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And uh, we even will talk a little about that in our lesson tonight. Why wasn't Daniel in the fire with his friends? Did he bow down to the idol? That's a good question. When you read the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the prior chapters, it talks about Daniel and his three friends were exalted to positions of leadership in Babylon. And all of a sudden, when Nebuchadnezzar invites all the authorities there, it only says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow down. People say, what about Daniel? Did he cave? No, probably Daniel was not there. He, Daniel also may not have been invited by the king because Daniel in the prior chapter had told the king, your head of gold is not going to last forever. And when the king made a statue all gold, he thought, Daniel's probably not going to approve of my ceremony. And he wasn't invited. He said, Daniel, you might want to stay here and manage affairs while we go to the plain of Dura. Or Daniel knew what was up and he excused himself. But I'm quite sure he wasn't there or he would have been standing. What is Abraham's bosom? This is from Luke 16, 19. Well, a good question. It only appears one time in the Bible. And I'll quickly summarize that parable for you. And there he says, there was a rich man that was clothed in purple that feasted sumptuously every day. And there was a certain poor beggar named Lazarus that laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The beggar died. Lazarus, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And there are actually some Protestant churches that have sort of made Abraham's bosom a Protestant version of limbo. It's like where souls wait until um, the resurrection. But Abraham's bosom, when you read the whole parable, Jesus is using a great paradox. He is just giving diametric opposites. You've got Lazarus, who represents the Gentiles, that laid at the gate of the nation of Israel, wanting the crumbs of truth that fell from their table while they feasted. And then they didn't care. As a matter of fact, even Jesus said to a Gentile woman, it's not good to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, because they called the Gentiles dogs. He, was, he did heal that lady, by the way. He was teaching uh, an illustration. But here he's got the Gentile going to Abraham's bosom. Then he says, but the rich man died, and he goes to the Greek place of torment called Hades run by God named Pluto. And so he's got them going to opposite spots. And Jesus was saying, if they do not believe Moses and the prophets, then they will not be persuaded the one should rise from the dead. Abraham's bosom is a symbol for where the saved go. And uh, it's a symbol for being redeemed. It's not talking about some conscious state or some uh, purgatory or limbo. It's, this is all a parable. All right. Where did God come from? You know, I just threw that in there because I wanted to make sure you all know, I don't know all the answers. <laughs> and uh, there is, that's a question where God is, the Bible says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. How can we explain that? Mm -hmm. You know, we, God made something from nothing. We can't explain that. And so where did he come from? And as soon as you try to explain who made God or where God came from, then you've got to explain where that came from. So at some point it's going to break down and you will have to admit something always existed 
or you're going to say that um, er, you know something came from nothing. So if something has always existed, uh, I believe it's God, and that's what the Bible says. He's the Alpha and the Omega, everlasting. Is the lake of fire just for the devil, the beast, and the false prophet, or do the wicked also get cast in? Well, the Lord doesn't want anyone to go to the lake and fire, but if you read in uh, Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the sheep and the goats, the wicked are cast into the lake and fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The wicked who follow the devil will share the fate of the devil. God doesn't want that to happen, but that's their choice. This question comes from India. Matthew 28, 1 says that, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and, of, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Doesn't this mean that a day begins at dawn and not in the evening when the sun is set? Now, if you compare the different Gospels there, it tells us that um, it was a great while before it was day. They began the journey. The sun hadn't even risen yet. It's simply saying at the end of the Sabbath, because prior to those verses, it says they stopped embalming his body before the sun went down to respect the Sabbath. They waited until the Sabbath was over. Sabbath ended then, of course, Saturday night at sundown. They needed to sleep a little bit and wait for light. So after the Sabbath was over, very early in the morning, as soon as they could get there, so they'd be there at first light, they, of course, found the tomb empty. Uh, but it's not saying that the Sabbath begins at dawn. It's just stating the record there. All right. We went through our questions very quickly. Our last question is, how do they keep the Sabbath in Alaska? And, and I think uh, Karen and I went on a, a cruise to Alaska a few years ago. I, I went to a men's retreat, and I said, why don't you cruise up with me? And I said, then you can fly home, and I'll go to the retreat with our son. And it, I remember we were watching the sun go down at 11.45 at night. It's really weird. And, and in the winter, of course, you know, the sun's going down. It, it depends on what part of Alaska. It goes down very early, comes up late. But you realize sundown, even though the sun may go down at 11.45, it'll be 24 hours until next sundown. And so sundown and sundown, still 24 hours, right? Now, what a lot of believers do in Alaska is they sort of fix a time because uh, sometimes the, the sky still stays bright. I mean, when I was there in the summer during the men's retreat, it's two in the morning, the sky's still bright. And it's just very strange. Any of you been up in those regions? You get up really far north like Barrow, Alaska, then the sun doesn't go down. I always think it's interesting. People don't have a problem with how to keep Sunday in Alaska. But when they hear the Sabbath truth, suddenly they start asking all these questions. Well, how do you keep the Sabbath in Alaska? <laughs> Folks never had any problem keeping Sunday, but now they, now they say, how can it be possible? <laughs> and then folks say, what if you're on the space station? How do you keep it there? And I just say, you keep it where you are when that time gets to you. Every seventh day, no matter where you are, every seventh day, there's a Sabbath. Thank you very much for your questions. All right. So we no longer are accepting questions to our Prophecy Encounter website. But if you have any other questions and you would like more information about what we've been studying, you can go to the Amazing Facts website and our study guides will probably answer all your questions. And if not, we have question sections in the Amazing Facts website and there are a lot of opportunities for you to get more information about the truth and the Amen. Bible. And, um, and it's simply Amazing Facts. Dot .org or yeah. amazingfacts.com they all work